From the Sumire Foundation and Connor B. Judge Foundation, this is Demystifying NMO. Welcome back to Demystifying NMO. I'm your host, Chelsea Judge, Scientific Advisor with the Connor B. Judge Foundation. Have you found navigating healthcare coverage and patient access complicated and confusing? You're not alone. That's why we have an expert in this topic on the pod today. I'm going to share with you my conversation with Marissa Shackleton, Executive Director at the Elliott Lewis Center in Massachusetts. Marissa has eight years of experience working with patients with MS and NMO, as well as patient advocacy organizations. She's an expert on access, reimbursement, infusion centers, and practice management. Marissa is clearly passionate about patient care and access to affordable treatment. I'm very grateful I had the opportunity to chat with her. Marissa and I recorded this conversation about a month ago, when SARS-CoV-2, or the new coronavirus, the virus that causes the disease COVID-19, hadn't yet been deemed a pandemic or even ravaged the United States. Now that it's reached all 50 states and has affected nearly all of us and put nearly most of all Americans in their homes with the goal to reduce the spread of the virus, it seemed vital to touch base with Marissa again and get her insight on how this pandemic may be affecting Edmo patients' approach to healthcare and access. Marissa will touch on what has changed in response to the pandemic and discuss key points of the major legislation Congress has passed to help ease healthcare access and affordability in the era of COVID-19. I hope you're all staying healthy and home practicing social distancing. We are in this together. All right, here's our initial conversation. Hope you guys enjoy. Hey, Marissa, thanks so much for joining us on the pod today. Can you share with our listeners a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, So my name is Marissa Shackleton. I'm the executive director at the Elliott Lewis Center. We're a private center caring for patients with multiple sclerosis, NMO, and other neurological disorders. We're located in Wellesley, Massachusetts. We have a large practice with specialized physicians, on-site infusion, and a large research program. My job is to oversee all these moving parts and Recently, I've been particularly involved in access to care for our patients. Cool. And so I'm assuming with your role, you're obviously very passionate about patient management, patient access. Can you give us like a little bit, you know, about why you're so passionate? Sure. So I've spent uh, the past nearly nine years working with patients with NMO and MS. I'm very active with the National MS Society, the Consortium of MS Centers, and the National Infusion Center Association. I've become very passionate about patient care, access to treatment, and making sure that treatment is affordable. Mm -hmm. So I'm a national speaker on access, reimbursement, infusion centers, and practice management. It's my goal to educate patients and practitioners to make sure that patients can access the best medication for their disease at a cost that's actually affordable. Well, that's awesome. And on behalf of the NMO patient community, thank you for your work. I know, I think most people know personally how complicated and confusing uh, patient access insurance can be. Do you have any advice or best practices for NMO patients? Sure, I agree. It can certainly feel like an uphill battle trying to get approvals through the insurance company. I think it's best for the patient and provider to work together on this. Assuming the patient and the provider are in agreement on the treatment, Mm -hmm. both need to be advocates to get approval from the insurance company. Many manufacturers can also assist in this approval process. They can provide letters of medical necessity and and form letters that can be used by patients and providers to help them advocate for themselves with the insurance companies. I always tell patients to be your own best advocate. Reach out to the insurance company directly directly to find out what their policies are on the particular medication and how you can petition them to have that approved. Um, The last thing the insurance companies want is to pay more money. Mm -hmm. So it's helpful for them to understand that treatment with a certain medication uh, will be beneficial to to the patient's health. And in the long term, it will reduce emergency room visits and hospitalizations. And those can be very costly. Uh, So it's in the insurance company's best interest to approve the medications now and prevent these high cost hospitalizations later. Okay, so those sound like a lot of good pro tips. And to me, it sounds like that 
to get the best success in getting treatments covered or approved um, requires a coordinated team approach with the patients advocating for themselves to the insurance companies, as well as their respective clinician in their shared decision, and then maybe even for the provider or manufacturer of the treatment. Absolutely. Is that just for private insurance companies or is that, does that hold true for Medicaid and Medicare? And before you even answer that, do you think that you could just give a brief highlight or overview of what Medicaid and Medicare are just for maybe our listeners who are new to the healthcare system game? Sure. So patients may obtain their insurance uh, commercially. So they may have a plan that's through their workplace mm -hmm. or um, purchased on the, the healthcare marketplace. Or they may have a government insurance, and Medicaid and Medicare are types of government-run insurance plans. Uh, Medic, they each have different qualifications for being eligible. Medicare is based on age or disability. Medicaid is uh, typically due to a financial status, whether you're eligible for a Medicaid. And then it can be a bit more complicated if you have both or if you have a managed Medicaid plan or if Medicare is covering... Um, up with a Part D and pharmacy benefits. So it's a bit complicated, but uh, to get back to your original question, these the advocacy efforts are for all insurance plans. Okay, um, okay. Anyone that, any insurer that you're working with, you should be able to submit an appeal if your medication is not originally approved. Okay, great. So no matter what, you can still advocate for yourself, no matter what your insurance provider is. Yes. Awesome. And so, okay, let's say our treatment, I'm the patient, I, I, got my, I got my treatment approved, I've advocated for myself along with my doctor, but now what if my treatment's still not affordable, even with my insurance coverage? Um, let's say it's still thousands of dollars that maybe me and my, my family and I just, we don't have. Um, is there anything that we can do uh, to address that? Yeah, so you can seek out some financial assistance programs. Uh, there are patient assistance foundations that help with the cost of medications and with the cost of health care in general. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, many assistance foundations don't yet provide funds to patients with NMO. Just this past year, the Assistance Fund, uh, which is a third-party foundation that provides financial support for health care costs, mm -hmm. they opened their funds to patients with NMO. Uh, but educational and advocacy platforms like this podcast help bring attention to the need for more financial assistance for patients with NMO. Well, thanks for the little shout out. Um, but I have a question when you said that NMO, for example, was just this year included in this assistance fund. Um, is that because prior to last year, there was no FDA approved treatment for NMO or is it because NMO is so rare or is it both? So I don't know the answer to that specifically. Each third-party foundation has different rules on who they're going to provide funding to, how much funding in a year, and you know what that criteria might be. So they may allocate a certain uh, dollar amount for patients with NMO this year, and that may change for next year. Um, and just because the foundation is available for applications for NMO right now may mean that it's not eligible later, but it's going to be eligible for patients with MS. So it's kind of on a rolling basis. It mm -hmm. can be hard to predict, but most of these third-party party foundations will uh, allow you to set up a notification for when that disease state has funds available. So you can send your application in at the right time. Okay, thank you. I've heard anecdotally that certain hospitals or healthcare systems um, might have programs available for financial assistance to patients receiving treatment at their facilities. For example, my husband in the past has previously received similar aid for his MS treatment. Um, is this something that is ubiquitous or found through all healthcare systems? I don't know about that specifically. Uh, I don't know about whether specific hospital systems, what their criteria is for offering financial assistance, but that's great. And it's certainly something that patients should ask about if they're receiving a treatment that's costly. That's a great avenue to explore. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I can only speak to my specific situation, but I think this also goes to what you are saying before um, regarding insurance companies, but just being your own best advocate and looking for options. It seems like there are also some good options for finding financial assistance for treatment costs if you have insurance approval, but 
let's, God forbid, say someone doesn't have insurance or for whatever reason they can't get their treatment covered, um, what options are available then? So again, there are different criteria for different medications Mm -hmm. and different insurance plans, but many of the manufacturers of the medications have a free drug program for patients who require treatment but cannot get it approved by insurance. They may require that you receive a denial from the insurance plan and then appeal it and Mm -hmm. receive a second denial, and then they can provide uh, medication at no cost. These programs are also open to patients who are uninsured, so no insurance, or underinsured, which means perhaps they're, if you're a Medicare-only patient, you're only covered at 80%. Mm. So those patients often are eligible for free drug. Also, patients who can say that their the cost is unaffordable to them, they may be considered for a free drug program. So if you've exhausted the assistance funds, the third party, the um, hospital assistance, and it's still an unaffordable cost, you can reach out to the manufacturer to see if they would you would be considered for their free drug program. I think that's all really incredibly helpful information. And I think what you're saying here is that aid is tied to financial income and other factors like that. Yes and no. Okay. Um, often the financial assistance programs that are run by third parties are tied to income. Mm-hmm. But the free drug programs are most often not. Ah. If you can demonstrate that it is unaffordable or that it cannot get approved through your insurance or you are underinsured, they're not asking for financial income, just a demonstration of financial burden. Okay. That's a big distinction. And I think that that's like a huge need for a lot of people where they're not necessarily meeting certain um, income status levels, but it's still obviously not affordable for them. I think this goes back to having patients advocate for themselves. If they have gone down some of these avenues for financial assistance and are not successful, calling the manufacturer, making a case for yourself why this medication is important for you to have, it's critical to your overall health care, but it's unaffordable, they'll generally put you in a direction of either one of these free drug programs or maybe they have other financial assistance options that you haven't discovered yet. I think that you're giving so much great information that's really empowering for patients so that they can be their best advocates. I really feel like these are like life hacks or something. I think that insurance plans can be pretty confusing. And I think it's also so important to make sure you're choosing the right plan for you and your family. But you have to you have to know what makes something a good plan for you and your family. Um, and so I thought we could have a quick basic talk first on key insurance terms for, you know, just for a, a refresher for ourselves or for patients who might be newly diagnosed or new to the healthcare system. Can you explain, for example, like the basics, like what's a deductible? What's a premium? Sure. Um, so a deductible is the amount you pay for healthcare services before your insurer pays. Uh, that's an, you typically an annual amount. Okay. The premium is a payment that you pay to maintain your coverage. It's often a monthly fee, or if you have insurance through your employer, perhaps it comes out of your uh, biweekly or monthly paycheck. And then some things that we hear a lot, you know, when choosing an insurance plan is, oh, that's a high deductible plan, or oh, that's a low deductible plan. Can you provide us with some information on that and maybe some guidance on selecting an appropriate insurance plan? Sure. So it's definitely complicated in choosing your insurance. It's about finding a balance between good coverage, a reasonable deductible, and premium. And those Mm -hmm. deductible and premium numbers tend to um, be inverse of one another. If you have a high deductible, you may have a low premium. But if you have a high premium, you may have a low deductible. So what does that cost look like annually? So I, I tell patients who have chronic disease, Assume you're going to pay the entire deductible each year Mm -hmm. between MRIs and treatment costs and see what that comes out to be. Is it worth paying more each month in the premium for a more expensive plan Mm -hmm. if it needs a lower deductible? Or is it worth having a higher deductible and a lower monthly cost? I see. So So even if you have um, a low deductible plan and you have um, higher premiums, you're still getting like that same basic coverage. It's just a matter of like how or when you're paying for it. Correct. Ah, 
that's very helpful. And it's different for patients with a chronic disease than it is for a patient who doesn't utilize their health care plan very often. Patients that don't use their health care plan very much during the year, it might be worth it to have the high deductible because they won't hit that deductible. Mm -hmm. But if chronic disease patients have MRIs and labs and infusion treatments, they're probably going to hit that deductible every year. Right. Okay. That's really helpful. So it sounds like you have to assess your insurance options, do some math, and then make an informed decision that way. For, yes. Are there any resources to help with that? Yes, there are many resources. It can be confusing as to, to where to go. Uh, so if you're purchasing your health insurance from the connector or the marketplace, you can visit the website to see your options and if you're eligible for any subsidies. So these subsidies would be a reduction in your premium cost. You can call or schedule an in-person appointment with an application counselor if you need assistance. This is a free service, and I advise that patients take advantage of these counselors that know the plans inside and out. If you have Medicare or Medicaid, there are counselors called SHINE counselors mm -hmm. serving the health insurance needs of everyone. Okay. And they are insurance counselors that are specifically focused on government insurance plans. They can assist in exploring Medicare or Medicaid plans. They review existing coverage, uh, so what your existing medications are and if they're covered, provide benefit comparisons and a few plans, assist with the applications, the enrollments, and appeals and review your eligibility for financial assistance. Wow. If you're receiving, <laughs> there's a lot. <laughs> this is um, great. If you're receiving commercial insurance through your employer, your spouse's employer, it's best to speak directly with the plan. So if your plan is Blue Cross Blue Shield and you're deciding between their low deductible or high deductible plan or a few different variants, an HMO or a PPO, you can contact Blue Cross and ask them about the differences in the plans, what your current healthcare situation is, what medications you're taking, and get receive some guidance that way. I think that this has been extremely valuable, um, great information for our listeners, and I'm really grateful to you, this top-notch um, insurance ninja, so to speak, and really grateful for all of the resources that you let us know are out there. Um, insurance is definitely um, a complex beast, and I think that you've simplified it to the best of anybody's ability, which is really, I think, empowering to the NMO community. So thank you so much, Marissa. Thank you. I appreciate you having me on the podcast. And while I do deal with insurance every day, it's still complicated for me. So I really understand how complicated it is for patients. And I hope some of these tips will help them advocate for themselves and get the best health care that they need. I really think so too. Thank you. Thank you. Well, really appreciate Marissa's insight. Next, I'm going to transition to our conversation related to COVID-19 and the healthcare system. Marissa, thank you so much for chatting with me again to give our listeners some COVID-19 specific information regarding navigating healthcare and patient access right now. I really hope you're doing as well as can be. Thank you. I'm happy to be back and speaking with you a little bit further um, now that we're dealing with COVID-19. This is unsettling times for everyone, especially those with chronic health conditions. And that being said, are there any guidelines for patients regarding their upcoming treatments in the next few days, weeks, even months maybe? Yeah, so there aren't really set guidelines uh, or rules for what patients should be doing aside from speaking with their providers. Mm -hmm. pa providers are going to take this case by case. So patients should speak with their providers about their upcoming treatment and they can discuss whether it's best to proceed, postpone, or change treatment during this time. Okay. Do we think social distancing or physical distancing, staying home while they're voluntarily to avoid illness or due to government mandate, could this potentially impact access to employer-based insurance? Yes. Unfortunately, mm. there is an increase in unemployment, which leads to loss of insurance. Uh, if you are now uninsured, you may be eligible to receive treatment through a free drug program or financial assistance program. We talked about these in a bit more detail earlier on. But now there's going to be a larger population who's going to be eligible for these programs because of their uh, employment and insurance status change. Okay, that makes sense. We're advising on um, patients from the Elliott Lewis Center mm -hmm. to call or email us as soon as they have any change or loss in insurance 
so that we can connect them to these programs and they don't miss a dose or have any delay in treatment. So you should certainly contact your provider sooner than later if you're having any change in insurance status. Well, that's great information and thank you for doing that and for advocating for patients. So are there any insight on the new legislation just passed by Congress in response to the pandemic? I know that it's called the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. What is this and how can this potentially help or affect patients? So this act is a legislative package that contains really important information that can affect patients living with chronic illness like NMO. It's a bit of a lengthy package, so I would advise you to read the details online so you can see it in its entirety. But um, I'd like to hit on some of the important points. One is that paid sick time and emergency leave is now available for employees who become infected with COVID-19. There's also emergency leave available for parents who have to take care of children who are home because of school closures, and that's affecting most parents across the country right now. They've also expanded uh, coverage for coronavirus testing. So regardless of your insurance status, whether you're uninsured, commercial insurance, Medicare, Medicaid, coronavirus testing is covered. If you meet criteria for testing and your physician recommends that you be tested, you do not need to worry about the cost of the test. Oh, that's awesome. And so you said this is regardless of health insurance status. So if you're unemployed or you don't have health care insurance, you'd still be able to get this covered. Correct. Okay. And this is specific to diagnosis of COVID-19. Um, we still don't have anything specific regarding coverage for treatment or if you needed to be hospitalized for COVID-19. No, we're not quite there yet, but hopefully we'll be looking at treatment options in the near future. Thank you. And I know that regarding social distancing, a lot of patients are considering either skipping their appointment or their next appointment, or I think there's now policies available to have telemedicine or telehealth visits. Yes, this is the, the part of that package that has been most impactful for our center because we have been able to switch all of our routine visits to telemedicine. So Medicare has removed the restrictions on telehealth. And it's a great way for patients and physicians to stay connected Mm -hmm. while staying distanced and and staying a safe distance apart and healthy. So I know primary care offices are using this for patients who are experiencing any symptoms. They recommend call first. Perhaps they'll set up a telehealth visit for you to decide what your next steps will be. And then for us dealing with MS and NMO patients, we have switched all of our routine visits over to telemedicine. It's not the same as seeing a patient in person, but it's definitely the safest option right now. Yeah, I agreed. Anything to help flatten the curve. And I think that's also what's recommended for patients if they are suspecting they have symptoms of COVID-19, not to go to the ER urgent care, but to call their clinician first and help be guided through, right? Absolutely. Make that phone call first if you're experiencing symptoms. You do not want to be exposing others in your primary care office or urgent care or the emergency department to any symptoms that you have. So make that call to your primary care physician first. Awesome. Well, Marissa, again, thank you so much for giving your time and insight. It's really helpful. And thank you. And I hope you're staying as healthy as possible. Thank you. Uh, Thank you for having me. And I hope that uh, the listeners and, and yourself stay safe and healthy through this this unsettling time. Thanks, Marissa. Thanks so much, listeners, for tuning in to another episode. I hope this information was helpful and empowering. As always, you can reach us at sumirefoundation.org or connorbjudgefoundation.org or check us out on social media at the Sumire Foundation or at CBJ VNMO. If you think you're showing symptoms of COVID-19, like cough, fever, and shortness of breath, please call your healthcare provider. Do not go to an ER or urgent care first. We don't want to flood those. Let your clinician listen to your symptoms and help guide you. We need to continue to help flatten the curve and give our healthcare system time to cope with the rising tide of COVID-19. Stay home, stay healthy. Sending love and hope to everyone. We're in this together.